morning, please, to the Gospel of Luke. And we're in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, just as an introduction in the lead up to my text this morning. And we're in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, commencing to read uh, down at verse number 42, please. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 4, and commencing to read. Now, verse number 40. We're going to commence at verse 40, please. Luke chapter 4, verse 40. Now, when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with divers diseases brought them unto him. And he laid his hands on every one of them, and he healed them. I want you to notice five things in that verse. I want you to notice there's a time in that verse. It says, and when the sun was setting. That's the time of day. When the sun sets, that means the day is coming to an end. The day is coming to a close. It's coming to the close of day. There's the time. I want you to notice also in that verse, there's a tragedy, because in this verse we have people tonight, today, who are sick with diverse diseases, sick beyond physical hope, tragedy. And then I want you to notice also in that verse there's a task. There's a task. Because those that were sick with diverse diseases, they weren't left lying there, not at all. They were brought to Jesus. And I want you to notice, fourthly, there was a touch in that verse. He laid his hands on them. And I want you to notice something else in that verse. There was a transformation. He laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Boys, there's a great verse for a good evangelical outreach night. The time, the end of the day. Dear child of God, it's drawing very close to a close, this day of grace. I'm telling you, as far as this day of opportunity is concerned, we're, in the, we're well into the evening. And there's people this morning, and they're perishing with sin and with all the rest of it. Ah, but tell me this. Are we bringing people, are we bringing these people to Jesus? Or are we letting them go there? Have we got a burden for them? Tell me this. Are we involved in the tasking, bringing these people to Jesus? Even though it's late in the day, yet the Lord is still saving and still well able to save. Wonder this morning, child of God, how many people have you brought to Christ this year? Many people can you mark down that you brought to Jesus, brought to a gospel meeting, brought to a gospel mission. Wonder how many people you personally have brought to Jesus. It's getting late. Then verse number 41, And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. For therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. Chapter 5, verse 1. Here's my text. And it came to pass, as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And we know that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his own precious truth for his own name's sake. In Luke's gospel, chapter 5, and verse number 1, 
Looking at that verse, you may say to yourself, boys, that that verse has very little to say. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he, he stood by the lake of Genesaret. Now, looking at that verse, you may think to yourself this morning, boys, that verse has, has, has very little to say. There's nothing really interesting in that verse. But yet and all in this verse this morning, it mightn't have much to say, but I'll tell you this, there's lots to see in that verse. There's something about that verse that jumps out. And what jumps out at me is that there is something in that one verse, unfortunately, unfortunately, is missing in so many Christians' hearts today. Now, what do I see in Luke 5, verse 1? What do I see in that one verse that I see very little of in Christians' hearts today? And mind you, it can appear in my heart because I'm no better than anybody else. Do you know what I see in Luke chapter 5 and verse 1 this morning? I see here a hunger a hunger to hear. A hunger to hear. A hunger to hear what, George? A hunger to hear. The Word of God. Wonder this morning, child of God, have, have you that hunger? Chapter number 4, the Lord Jesus begins His public ministry. In verse 16, he teaches the truth. Do you know how the Lord Jesus preached? He preached how every man ought to preach. The Lord Jesus did not preach what people wanted to hear. The Lord Jesus never preached that way. Too many in pulpits today, and that's the way they're preaching. They only preach what people want to hear. But the Lord Jesus never preached in a way in which or that which people wanted to hear, he preached in what people needed to hear. He preached, and he taught what people needed to hear. And I want you to notice in my text this morning, Luke chapter 5, verse number 1, I want you to notice, first of all, the people's approach. And it came to pass. It came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the Word of God. I want you to notice the Lord Jesus as he stands. As he stands and as he teaches the people. As he stands and as he preaches to the people. I want you to notice how the people thronged him. How the people crowded around him. You can almost see the surge of people getting close and, and, and couldn't get close enough. You see, the attractiveness of the Lord Jesus in this instant was the message that he had for the people. They were eager to get close because they were eager to hear every word and every phrase and every part what the Lord Jesus had to say. They pressed upon them. They couldn't get close enough. It's like what we see in Mark chapter 2. You remember in Mark's gospel chapter 2, it was noised that abroad that he was in the house, and it says, and he preached the word unto them, and there wasn't as much room to get into the house because the Lord was there preaching to them. I see an eagerness this morning. I see a keenness within their heart for the word. His word was what they wanted. It was his word that they were after. It was his word what they longed for. His word is precious. Tell me something, child of God. Is God's word precious to you this morning? Is God's Word what you long for, what you hunger for this morning, the, the Word of God? Who 
His Word was everything to them. And you know, child of God, the Word of God has ought to be everything to us this morning. It's the manna for the heart. It's the manna for the soul. And I wonder this morning, child of God, that they, they pressed upon Him, they pressed upon the Lord Jesus to hear the Word of God. There was no lingering. There was no standing about. There was no waiting. They pressed upon Him to hear what the Lord had to say to them. Here's the challenge this morning. How have you approached this service? How have you approached this morning this meeting? What attitude have you this morning as you came through that door? Ah, well, it's just the Lord's Day morning, and it's the done thing. Too many Christians today come with that attitude. wonder if you come this, to this meeting this morning to pick faults in what the pastor has to say. Oh, a lot of people would come with that attitude. He talks too loud, preaches too long. Or have you come with the attitude this morning, what has the Lord to say to me? As I look at the Lord Jesus and I see the people, I see the people's approach. Their one intent to get near Christ was to hear, to hear His Word. The people's, the people's approach. Have you come this morning to the tabernacle here expecting the Lord to speak to you? Have you come to this service this morning? Have you come to this meeting this morning? Not to hear what George McConnell has to say, but what the Lord has to say. It's the Lord. You see, every Lord's Day morning, I must come with the Lord's message. I believe that's what the Lord's mornings are for, bringing the Lord's message to the Lord's people. It's not just about bringing a word. Any person can bring a word. It's my responsibility to, to bring the Lord's message to the Lord's people, whatever that message may be, there's times I come to this pulpit and I wonder if I've got it right at all. There's many a time I wrestle in the quiet place and say, Lord, this, this doesn't feel right. It doesn't sound right. But the Lord has to say to me in many occasions, none of your business how it feels. It's my message and you bring that message. And nine times out of ten, when I thought it wasn't the Lord's message, I'm in the prayer meeting at the back, and somebody would actually pray perhaps the very text that I'm going to preach from. And the Lord confirms it. And there's sometimes I get a text message later on in the afternoon from some brother, perhaps, or some sister, thanking me for the word that was brought, because it was for them, and I have to send the wee text back. It wasn't my word, brother or sister. It was the words, Lord, you thank him. I'm just the messenger. And I wonder this morning, have you came to this meeting, not just this meeting, any meeting, have you just come this morning with the attitude, well, it's the dumb thing I'd need to be seen? Or have you come this morning with this approach? I can't wait to get out this morning to hear what the Lord has to say. After I was converted, 
after I was converted, you know. Monday evenings was Faith Mission Prayer Union night. There was something about the old prayer unions, and if anybody here ever went to a prayer union, you know what I'm talking about. There was something about them prayer unions. And I'll tell you, it was there where I grew in my faith at the start. I often look back to me days in my granny's house, Granny Armstrong. And she used to have an old dog, Shep, you call him, one of them black and white collie dogs, and every time it was tea time, he was the first to the table. And he used to sit with the two ears up like that. And he watched every bite. And he used to sit beside me, funny enough, because he knew he got more than crumbs falling from my table. My granny, she used to bake the best soda bread there was, and I used to take lumps of the soda bread, the crust, and he used to sneak them down, and there he was, nibbling away. He was there because he was hungry for what I could give him. Tell me this, child of God, is that how you've approached this meeting this morning, expecting something from the, from the Lord? The people's approach, they pressed upon him. Notice, secondly, the people's appetite. It says that the people pressed upon him. They pressed upon him, what for? To hear. To hear the word of the Lord. Child of God, this morning as I look at Luke chapter 5 and verse number 1, yes, reading over it, it mightn't have much to say, but I'll tell you this, there's much to say in it. And what I see in Luke 5, verse number 1, first and foremost, I ask my own heart, is this what I have, an appetite? Listen, man, what drives you to the kitchen table in the evening? I'll tell you what drives me to the kitchen table in the evening. It's, it's the appetite. When you work up a bit of an appetite, I'll tell you, it's hard to keep me from the kitchen table. You know, child of God, have you an appetite for the Word of God? Before I was saved, I had no interest. No interest in the Bible at all. The Bible was a strange book to me. It was, it was known as the good book in our house. It was never known as the Word of the Lord. It was known as the good book or the Bible. But after I got saved, you know, I fell in love with the Bible. And I got a taste for it. It was like one of the first dates Tracy and I went out on. Thought I would take her out to a wee restaurant, and I left it up to her. And she suggested the Chinese restaurant in Bonbridge. And I remember when the Chinese restaurant came to Hunter Cloy first. Oh, my mother said to me, don't ever eat anything out of there. He says, why is that, Mum? Have you not noticed, she said? Notice what? Have you not noticed there's no pigeons about anymore? He says, right enough. There used to be pigeons around Mrs. Woods, the, the commercial hotel. There used to be pigeons everywhere, and then suddenly they disappeared. And she says, did you not notice Charlie Moore? Charlie Moore? What about Charlie Moore? He's not walking his greyhounds in the other... He's walking the greyhounds on the other side of the street now. He's afraid. I says, Mum, I wear that with you. There wouldn't be enough meat in those two greyhounds of Charlie's. They're half starved to make a pot of soup. But anyway, she took us to... As you see, that's the way my mother brought me up. Soda bread and jam. That was your treat. Paris bun if you're going well. Bowl ice cream was a big thing. We head off this Chinese in Bombridge. And the Chinese, next thing was handed this menu, and I couldn't add her my head nor tail of it. And we wait her come over. She says, yes. And I said to her, could I have a fish supper, please? <laughs> and I got this kick under the table. Oh, she was starting off on the right foot, our Tracy. She was starting off. She says, you're not going to go for a fish supper. We'll go for a Chinese dish. And I had these thoughts in my mummy's head. I had thoughts of Miss Woods as pigeons. But you know, she says, trust me, this is our Tracy, trust me, she says, 
I'll never forget my first dish. It was sweet and sour chicken Cantonese style boiled rice. And she went for some sort of duck or something. I don't know what it was. But I'll tell you this. It tasted lovely. And from that night to this night, from that day to this day, every Saturday evening, it's Chinese night. If it's not Johnny Pang's, it's wee Jimmy's in the sunflower, or a Chinese near home. Fell in love with it. I love Chinese. Maybe you don't, but I do. Well, it was the same with the Bible. The moment I got saved, I got a taste of manna for the soul and for the heart, and I'll tell you, I fell in love with it. Oh, friend, let me tell you something about the Bible this morning. It's the bread for the soul, and it's a bread that doesn't go stale. See, the more you delve into the Word of God, the more hungrier you get. Oh, child of God, I remember we saw me workman away back in 1988. 88 it was. 1988! And a gospel mission encouraged me and enlightened me and taught me how I should read the Word of God every day when I would read the Bible through, every year. And since 1988 to this very day, I've been reading the Bible through and through and through. And I'll tell you, I'm not getting sick of it. My hunger's getting more for it. The more you read the Word of God and the more you learn the Word of God, the more you hunger for it. But too many Christians are in the biscuit tin of the world. You know what the biscuit tin of the world is? Many of God's people have lost their appetite for God's Word. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 2 and 2, As newborn babes desire ye the sincere milk of the Word. Let me put that in agricultural terms. Desire ye the full cream milk of the Word. Heaven's semi-skim now, isn't it? Semi-skim milk, semi-skim butter. They're nearly soon of semi-skim water out now. Heaven semi-skim, low-fat test. You see, they're doing the same with the Word of God. They're watering the Word down. They're treating the Word of God the same way we, lad, Nathan, used to treat a salad sandwich. He used to set our Nathan down a salad sandwich. He'd lift up the first layer of bread and he says, oh, don't like them, we think. And he dissected the sandwich before he read it. Now they're dissecting the Word of God. They don't like the word repentance now. They don't like the word sin now. They don't like to use the word blood now. They don't like to use the word cross now. Desire ye the sincere milk of the word. I know the word of God can offend us at times. It doesn't really offend. It troubles us. And the word of God will always trouble us where we need to be troubled. There's things that troubles me in this word. But it's for my good. The best milk a mother can give her baby is her own milk, for she has everything in it. Everything's there to give that baby life and health. And God has everything in his word to help us to grow thereby. Do you see the people's approach? Do you see the people's appetite? They're hungering for the Word. They're hungering for what he has to say. Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. But do you see the people's awareness? They were full aware this was no ordinary word. This wasn't just the word of a man. They pressed upon him to hear. 
Hear what the Word the Word of God. Psalmist could say, The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. I'll ask you this question. Why is the Word of God precious? Why? Why is the Word of God precious? It's because it's God's Word. It's God's Word. It's not my Word. It's God's Word. And this people were aware that this was the Word of the Lord. And I'll tell you, the devil's at work today. Do you know the devil believes more in the power of the Word of the Lord than what some of the Christians do? That's why the devil is saying to it that the Word of the Lord is banished out of schools. That the Word of the Lord is banished out of here, and the Word of the Lord is banished out of there. Because I'll tell you, he knows only fine too well that it's the Word of the Lord. See, it's Spurgeon said, what, God's, what God needs today is people with a more scriptural and biblical knowledge. People of such, says Spurgeon, are an instrument that the Holy Ghost can really grip. He said, this slippery fish who have no knowledge is no use to the Lord. He continued in saying this, the revival we need today is in Bible reading and studying amongst the people of God without prejudice, without criticism, and self-opinion. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Tell me this this morning, are you a furnished saint or are you a famished saint? There's too many believers and they're on the SMO diet, the SMO diet, Sunday morning only. They'll come out on the Sunday morning, get a wee bit, and that's supposed to carry them down through a week. Why do you think this morning we have a Bible class here on a Thursday evening? It's just so that we can bring you deeper into the Word of God so that God through me can, and other servants can deepen your knowledge through the Holy Ghost, deepen your knowledge into the Word of God. Tell me, do you hunger for the Word of God? Is it the bread of life or is it just a wee bicky you take on a Sunday morning? Because what we need today is what these people had in Luke 5 and 1. A hunger to hear, not tripe, but truth. You thank God today that you have the Scriptures. Thank God today for the sacred page. This is no ordinary book to be left on a shelf to gather dust. It's the Word of God to your heart, and it's the Word of God to my heart. And may we, and listen, if you don't have an appetite, ask God to give you one, and he will. The people pressed upon him their approach. 
the hear, the appetite, the Word of God, the awareness. I always measure a person's appetite for spiritual things And again, I'm referring to see it, Spurgeon. Not by seeing how many's out on a Lord's Day morning, but to see how many's out at a Bible class. To be out at a Bible class, it takes more effort, more sacrifice of time. And I wonder, child of God, have you, have I, a real appetite for what God Himself has given to us so that we could live according to His way each day. Thank God for the sacred page. May God bless His Word. And may God bless us more with an appetite for the Word of God in these days. Our closing hymn is